So um, we're going to continue our discussion of the Ouroboros. And we had said before that we would go back and take it one sentence at a time, which I think is a good idea because there's an awful lot here. And uh, it quickly gets overwhelming if you go too fast. So yeah, let me pull my oh, got the shelf here real quick. Still getting settled into this office. So everything's still a little bit disorganized. All right. Okay. <clears throat> I believe you were using the passage from page 140. Yeah, starting at the bottom of page 140. Right. So if you want to read that, I have a question for you about that first sentence. Yeah, just the first sentence. Okay, the, the primordial theriomorphic serpent god is endless potential, is whatever being is prior to the emergence of the capacity for experience. Okay, so I'm trying to interpret that. Did you happen to look up theriomorphic? I did. I think it's just like snake or serpent like. I, 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 I did look it up at one point, but then well, it, so it wasn't. Perfect, this means form of some sort, right? So, Therio probably has to do with the shape. So, yeah, that makes sense. So, oh, he maybe that. I said, think maybe that. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say, I think that it's a reference to the fact that it, it is, it's representing multi, multiple categories simultaneously. Oh, the cat bird. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what it's. Okay. So that that actually makes it feel a little bit better to know that it's representing all those different categories. Because if I think of it strictly as the serpent and strictly as the circle, I get a little bit, um, well, I get a little bit uncomfortable, but I also get a little bit lost with where he's going with it. But anyway, mm -hmm. in that first sentence, he says, it is whatever being is prior to the emergence of the capacity for experience. Now, when he says prior to the emergence of the capacity for experience, I assume he's saying prior to the beginning of time. Is that the um, that? No, I, I, I would. Because to me, time is the beginning of the capacity for experience. That's certainly an element of it, I would say, but I, maybe more specifically here, consciousness. Oh, consciousness. Okay, okay. Well, I hadn't read it that way, but okay. So the, 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 uh, the Earl Burroughs is endless potential. And when I think of potential, I think of that which has not yet occurred. Is that correct? Like the future, the unknown. That yeah, has not been explored. That that's what I see too. But it's it's yeah, and, and the fact that it's endless suggests something like. I don't know, something something greater than what we think about when we think about potential. Um, I, I think I think something like when we, especially in the modern frame, when we think potential, we, we tend to think about probability maybe even. Like there's this set of things that can happen and here's the the possibilities and here, you know, here's the probabilities of going down this path or the other where I think this is something much, much broader. And that, that, that's why that adjective at endless is, is, um, is important to, to focus on. It's, it's, again, he, he, it's, it's, 
brought to bear further down the line, but uh, you know, where he talks about uh, this, what he's talking about here is in some sense being itself. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's much more, much more breadth than just say drawing a line between all these uh, possibilities and, and what the potential is in them. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Well, so let me go on with the second sentence then. So this potential has been represented as the self-devouring dragon most commonly because this image aptly symbolizes the union of incommensurate opposites. So um, I looked up incommensurate and it basically means unmeasurable or those things which don't have measurable similarities. Right. So when it says the union of incommensurate opposites, are you taking that as like the, the, the two poles, the head and the tail united? Or are you taking it in the sense of many forms? I think it's all those things at once. Um, it's it is there is a, a polarity to it in its simplest form. Mm-hmm. Between you could think of any dichotomy and apply it to that. You know the subject and the object, the um, um, chaos and order. All these different like dichotomies that become our our most basic categories for understanding the world. Um, and it, I think the idea is that all of it is subsumed in this, this concept. Um, okay, but in his illustration, he specifically calls this thing chaos. So if it's illustrating the union of chaos and order, how can it be chaos alone? I mean, this, see, this is what is confusing me about his description because they can, the description is all encompassing it's like mm-hmm. the description mm-hmm. is a meta a meta level that's above everything else and right then, within that within paul's yeah, conversation of the within that right within within that conversation of the meta divine realm it is it is the that meta level that is that substrate that everything all the all the beings are subject to um, it's it's more primordial than any of the what what pagans thought of as deities. Um, it is it is more basic and 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 more timeless even than them in some sense, because they're they're subject to its its structure. They have to play by its rules. But it's not it's not what the the ancients would have called like the demiurge, is it? I I would feel pretty uncomfortable. I'm I'm not <laughs> my my philosophy is pretty weak. Um so I don't, I don't know I know very I know a little bit about that but I don't know specifically if that's I think this is this 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 conceptual framework predates anything we would recognize as philosophy. Okay. Um and and I think that's what he's trying to to, to tie into um, that there is there's something that um, ancestors who who had a much more participatory participatory interaction with the world how they they conceptualize this stuff and it was much more in one sense very simplified in terms of these very basic categories but at the same time within those categories there's a richness and a complexity that we're kind of completely unfamiliar with mm-hmm. um, today. And yet for them, uh, it was very useful, you know? Um, and I, I, I think par- partially what we have to resist in, in talking about this within a modern frame is trying to just completely map it onto our modern categories mm-hmm. to make it easier. Like, because, you know, one, like the way we want to, get to the root of this is we want to slice it up into pieces <laughs> and make it easier, more bite-sized for us to interact with. And that's, mm-hmm. that's something if you, 
the the whole way that this this flows is 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 resisting that at every step right i mean you think you have a handle on it and then he, he takes one step further in increasing the breadth of what it is he's describing which it, it does make you wonder in some sense is is this a useful category at all but it i don't know it, like you said there's something there's something resonant in it, in it for me that that feels like it ties into something true mm -hmm. um, that I, that, that I wouldn't have language for otherwise. Well, let me go a little bit further ahead then instead of dicing it up and slicing it too finely, let's, let's try to capture a big idea and then go back and look at that big idea. The Ouroboros is simultaneously representative of two antithetical primordial elements. As a snake, the Ouroboros is a creature of the ground, of matter. As a bird, a winged animal, it is a creature of the air, the sky, the spirit. The Ouroboros symbolizes the union of known associated with spirit and unknown associated with matter. Explored, and unexplored. It symbolizes the juxtaposition of the masculine principles of security, tyranny, and order with the feminine principles of darkness, dissolution, creativity, and chaos. <clears throat> Maybe we'll stop it. I don't know if you found this interesting, but I found this interesting that, that spirit is known in matter is unknown. Yeah, I wondered if he had made an error there in his I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think again this is this is where we kind of have things a little bit upside down in our modern context. Um but I well it's because we we so much of our I don't know. I mean, what, what, what this is something, uh, what this is indicating to me or like immediately speaks to is of the, the sacramental nature of, of all of creation in reality, that matter isn't this dead stuff, that it is much more alive with possibility than we, when we, we conceptually think about it. Um, and that, uh, you know, um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, we, we, we tend to think, see, I, I think, I think part of the problem is that we want to put God into certain categories. And so we're trying, what I, when I find myself doing when I read this is I'm trying to figure out where God fits in this mm -hmm. and right. He's, he's kind of outside of this and beneath it all right? He's also, he's integrated with it in a certain way, but he's also distinct from it as well. And so like he, um, I don't know, I find this, this, this thought exercise just useful for kind of exploding those, uh, the, the kind of limited view we have of who God is. It's, it's a, it's a way of, of, uh, re-understanding both creation and, and who God is fundamentally. Well, so, so if, when I was trying to contemplate the spirit as the known and the, <clears throat> the matter as the unknown, one of the things that occurred to me is that it's a natural inclination of man to explore matter. So, even the scientists have an instinctive feeling that matter, that there's something about matter that's unknown and that needs to be explored because matter is what we slice and dice and take apart and, and, and try to get down to the essence of it. And um, we've gone down layers and layers and layers and layers and now we're down to the quantum bits and trying to, you know, and it's still unknown because it still doesn't fit together the way the scientists would like it to fit together. So, 
So in that sense, certainly there is something about the unknown that is associated with matter. And right. spirit but is something that, that maybe for the ancients was something that they could know much more intimately because it was, it was personal experience. We don't see that so much in our culture, but I've known missionaries who worked in places like Africa and Haiti and places like that, where for those people, the spirit world is much more alive and with them all the time. And they're very conscious of the spirit mm -hmm. world. It's much more of a known quantity for them in a sense, in that sense. So, so I, I can kind of, get the picture of what he's talking about here. But when I got off the rails was when he, he goes on in the next phrase, he says, explored and unexplored. But spirit is in the explored category and matter is in the unexplored category. And that's where it really but, didn't make too much sense to me to think that this, the, uh, the air, the sky, the spirit, is explored and the matter. Well, think of it this way like the spirit in some sense i think we tend to have a top very top down view of these things right where the spirit um kind of directs matter but there's another way you can look at it too where spirit is something that emerges from the underlying matter so it, it is kind of a distillation of something that exists in a more complicated way within the structure of matter itself, right? So when, when Peterson, for instance, talks about, say, like the spirit of the father, something that is represented, that, that in some sense uh, reveals itself over these long stretches of time yeah. and all these different people who play out this structure. And it's actually, in some sense, embedded in us biologically so that we we not only recognize it propositionally, but there's all these other levels at which we act that out and recognize and model that. Um, and that there's something emergent about that, what, what, that, what we think of as spirit. Um, and that, I think that's how he's referring to spirit here. Um, it, is, it is the distillation of what we've explored as, so matter, again, so like you think of it this way, like, so this universe, there's all this stuff in it, you know, and, and it's relative to us, it's infinite. Um, and we've explored some portion thereof of it. Most of it's, you know, let's, let's say we've explored, I don't know, 1% of it. Yeah. Maybe probably that's, that's probably like an overestimation, yeah. right? So we explored 1% of it, but even within that explored 1%, we've, we've taken another level out of it that is kind of a distillation from that explored 1%. And that's kind of what we deal with and talk about propositionally. That's what we have more explicit models for. Um, that's what we could, you know, identify in our cultural um, representations of that explored area. That's very helpful. So, so it's another further distillation of, of the explored. Um, but, but it's in some sense still so out of touch with this vastness that we haven't touched yet. So have you done any listening to Stephen Wolfram or read any stuff from him? I've not. I've, I, I'm familiar with uh, Wolfram Alpha, the, the product they make. It's like a mathematical search engine of sorts, but and, yeah. and that it's a way of, he has some sort of way of trying to structure knowledge such that it's more easily searchable, but I, that's about all I know about him. Well, he, he, uh, he's very interested in mathematical, mathematical constructs maybe you would say but mm -hmm. um he wrote a book called the new kind of science which i have not read but i heard him the other day talking with lex friedman 
and they were discussing these two concepts that Wolfram has come up with, computational equivalence and computational irreducibility. So I was trying to do some study on them to try to understand, because at one point he talked about when you, when you draw the dividing line and he, he went like that, and it just felt like Jordan Peterson when he said that. And I thought, there's gotta be something there. There's some connection there. So I went and looked it up and um, here's just what I think it was maybe Wikipedia says about Wolfram. He suggests that the theory of computational irreducibility may provide a resolution to the existence of free will in a nominally deterministic universe. He posits that the computational process in the brain of the being with free will is actually complex enough so that it cannot be captured in a simpler computation due to the principle of computational irreducibility. Thus, while the process is indeed deterministic, there is no better way to determine the being's will than in essence to run the experiment and let the being exercise it. And that sounds a little bit to me like what you're talking about in, in that we, we live our lives throughout history from the beginning until now and through thousands of years of history of running our lives and running our families and neighborhoods and cultures and civilizations out of that distilled some understanding of what the basic substructure of the universe is. And that understanding in this thing that Jordan Peterson is talking about, that's, that's the spirit of the thing or the, maybe the essence. Is that kind of what you mean? The essence of the thing? Essence being, oh, oh yeah, spirit. Yeah. I think that's good. Yeah. Good definition for it in this way. Um, It, it, yeah, it's it's interesting though because yeah, I, I I don't know. Like this is this is a word, um, this word spirit that's tripped me up a lot because it's philosophical concepts context. So it's 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 difficult to to get anything precise around it. Um, it's one of the biggest points that in this book that I'm, I'm re going through, um, which is uh, the great war between CS Lewis and Owen Barfield, which, oh. which is a really, really fascinating book. I, I think I, I started reading that book first before I read some other books on Owen Barfield and thinking it would be the easiest one. It was, it's, it's, there's just so many things in there that trip you up if you don't have some sort of background in the, the works of the, the underlying um, people. I knew C.S. Lewis really well, but really the, all the interesting novel stuff in there is from Barfield and I had, I had a hard time understanding it. And spirit is one of those words, again, that I'm not sure uh, I know what they mean when they use it. Um, but in this context specifically, I, I think that's what it, it essence or distillation or or pattern mm. um but in some sense you know as, as peterson points out the pattern can be more enduring than the underlying matter which falls apart but um so it's it's in some sense it's it's ephemeral but it's more lasting Well, I really like what you just said. The pattern can be more enduring than the underlying matter that falls apart. And, and that's what we are to some extent, right? When you, we talk about ourselves, right? Like all like, you know, there's most of the cells that 
were in me years ago aren't here, but there's this pattern, you know, this, this story that is you and I, that, that allows a continuity um, in spite of all, all that's manifestly changed in the physical substrate. Well, one of the weird things I heard the other day about viruses, which I didn't realize, is that a virus is not a cell in the way that like bacteria is a cell. So virus is not alive in the same way that bacteria are alive. Right. A virus enters the cell and rewrites the DNA. So well, actually it uses it hijacks mechanisms in the cell to just make copies of itself. But it is so it's so DNA is a double stranded piece of code which has error correction built into it. Viruses mutate a lot more because they're a single stranded piece of RNA that has molecules attached to it that act as kind of like keys that fit in locks on receptors on the cell, trick the cell into letting it inside. Once it's inside, it, it hijacks the RNA encoding mechanisms of the cell to create more and more copies of itself. And then they so basically- it's just using the copying mechanism. Wow. Yeah. So, so wow. the way the way DNA works is, DNA gets read, it gets read into like a, a a strand of RNA, and RNA is is what's actually used to make the proteins that make a cell. Mm -hmm. It's got a it's got an RNA sequence that makes itself, and it's got a little attachment onto it that hooks into the cell and says, "Hey, let me in," and gets in there and starts making tons of copies of itself. Um, those those copies eventually overwhelm the the cell it explodes and now there's bunches more of this virus floating around to go restart that process in another cell wow okay that's even scarier than i thought <laughs> <laughs> yeah which it's it's the smallest it's not technically living because it doesn't have any of the machinery to do this on its own it's by definition parasitic but there's they, there's estimates are that there's something like, I don't know, 16 trillion of these things. It's the most prevalent, if you considered it living, living thing on the earth mm -hmm. is these viruses. And so it's tiny. And they, they, like I said, they don't, they're just RNA. They don't have DNA. So because of that, they're much, much, much more susceptible and easily easier to mutate because they don't have the other side the, the other side of the, of the helix acts as an error correction mechanism. Um, and just being the single strand, it's easy for things to get knocked out of place and moved around all the time. And so even with uh, like this, um, the COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the underlying virus of the disease, there's like, I don't know, they've already identified like four or five different versions of it. Mm -hmm like major versions, like they, they like think of it as like a tree structure and it branches majorly here, even in, and even within those different tree structures, there's minor variations as well, because that's, that's just how viruses are. They, they, they mutate quite frequently because they're, they're unprotected floating around <laughs> things that are changing all the time. It's funny because people, people get really hear about it evolving. They get really scared, but it's just, it's like, most of, most of the mutations that happen to a virus are actually beneficial for us because they stop its effectiveness in one way or another. They make it less good at doing what it's doing. So the, the evolutionary path of most viruses over time is that they become less virulent. They become less um, damaging in terms of their effects on, on their host. And that actually is good for the virus because it mean, if they don't kill their host, then they'll survive, they'll get, be around longer to make more copies and spread exactly. You know, it's like viruses like Ebola that are very easy to contain because they kill everybody. And so we just contain those people, they all die and the virus, you know, goes away. Whereas a virus that hangs on in a more parasitic fashion and does less harm uh, is going to survive more, mm -hmm. like the flu. Well, so one of the things that I read the other day was that um, I think Sarah Salviander, who is a she's a astronomer. No, that's not right. At, as, 
astrophysicist. That's what she is. She's an astrophysicist. Anyway, um, she was talking about how viruses are what keep bacteria in line. <laughs> that if there weren't viruses on the earth, the bacteria would have taken over the whole earth a long time ago. Because there are so yeah. many bacteria and the viruses are kind of what control the bacteria. So. If, if you do a YouTube search for bacteriophage, mm -hmm. that's, that's the best on ramp into that conversation. So the bacteriophage is like a, a virus that is attacking a specific bacteria. Um, it's really interesting too, because these, these all exist with, it's not very well studied, but bacteriophages and bacteria, you know, obviously they're playing a big role in your gut biome all the time. And it's weird. Certain, certain environmental conditions will turn on a bacteriophage to suddenly go active again when it hasn't been active. And, um, it's very, it's very interesting and weird, but, but a lot of people are thinking that's like the, the way to solve our problem of resistant um, bacteria to drugs, right? There's all these different bacteria out there that are resistant. Um, and one of the problems that you have today is if you take an antibiotic, you don't just affect the bad bacteria. You, you shut down all you like your, all this good bacteria in your, your gut is being affected as well. With a bacteriophage though, you, you're laser focused on a specific bacteria. So you would introduce a bunch of that bacteriophage, again, effectively a virus that it targets that one bad bacteria and you can delete it pretty quickly with, with real efficiency towards the thing that you know is causing the problem. Mm. Um, which would be so interesting. That, once that is very interesting when you think of, the, you know, like in getting ready for our talk here, I was looking through the symbology of the serpent in the scriptures. And uh, one of the first places that the serpent shows up again after Genesis is in the book of Exodus, <clears throat> when Moses goes to talk to Pharaoh to try to get him to let the people go. And God says to Moses, take your rod and throw it on the ground and it will turn into a serpent. And so like, that's the first like miracle, right? <clears throat> but then the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians are able to come and throw their rod on the ground and turn it into a serpent as well. But eventually, Moses' serpent eats up the, the uh, magician serpent. So Jonathan Peugeot was talking about that as the good serpent and the bad serpent, that there, there are these two symbols in the scripture, the good serpent and the bad serpent. And the, it's like, so it's like the bad serpent is the disease and the good serpent is the cure. Um, <clears throat> And I've been thinking for a long time and never able to kind of put my thoughts in order, but I'd been thinking for a long time, long before this virus ever hit. I was thinking about how sin is very much like a virus in the way that it got into, maybe it's more like a bacteria, I don't know, but it got into humans in the Garden of Eden and um, and then it sort of just mutated and grew over time and filled out all of humanity. So we're, we're contaminated with this virus or this bacteria or whatever it is. But when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, those who believe or those who look to him, you know, the, serp the, uh, the bronze serpent on the staff lifted up. He said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Mm -hmm. when we look to him, then it's like we we receive the cure, the the rewriting, so to speak, of the the virus. It gets yeah. rewritten in us. It's changed somehow. Right, and, and it well, it, I was just because it's interesting too that that the 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 cure is is modeled after the disease, right? Because in that case, it was it was serpents that was in among the camp that had bitten them and they were all dying. Uh -huh. And then it's a serpent that they're looking at. And the same thing with in the cross, there's this idea of death being used to destroy death. Yeah. Um, there's obviously something very deep there that, that it, it's in this kind of Ouroboros pattern again of like something going around the circle, like the thing 
that is the problem is also used to create the solution. Um, it's like one thing, which is interesting. Yeah, and so then that made me think about that verse in Romans that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So it's like God can take even a bad thing and turn it into a good thing. Um, <clears throat> the, que the big question that gets difficult, I think, is People want to get into this argument, well, did God create the bad thing in the first place? Or did the bad thing happen for some other reason? And then God, when it when we put that, when we put it into God's hands, then he takes that and turns it into something good. Yeah. Well, it, there, but there's maybe I'm maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit too far because we're going to try very hard not to try to find God in this passage, but to just discuss the passage as it is. <laughs> so maybe we could set aside that idea for later. And, and um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's definitely underneath all of this. Um, and it's, 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 it's entwined with, the modern problem of evil, which is what you were just articulating, right? You know, that, well, if God's all good, how, where did this evil come from? And it's, it's a very difficult question to answer um, without, without pulling back the layers of some of your, um, your modern lens. And I, that's why I think this, this Ouroboros idea is really interesting because it, it goes back before that. Now, the, what they seem to be describing, or at least what most ancient myths seem to describe, is is a sort of again the hero god that that fights with the, the chaos monster that is separate from it, um, which is completely different. And it does seem like in the Book of Job, for instance, that Yahweh is portrayed in that way to some degree, as uh, as this you know, this force to reckon with. Now, now some of that, I don't know if that's actually the case. That's what a, a lot of literary criticism of it suggests, but I don't know if that, if that's how the people who wrote it and read it understood it, or if that's, you know, a lens we have from comparing it to other, um, you know, Near East ancient literature around the same time that has similar uh, kind of conceptual frameworks. But yeah, I don't think you can look at this without having those questions that you just brought up up here. Um, and, and they're, they're really at the heart of, you know, of God's character and his goodness, you know. Um, one of the interesting things for me to think about that I often find myself thinking about is this sort of, we, it seems like we almost, we need this sort of dichotomy, right? In some sense, you can't, you can't really, it's, for whatever reason, this seems to be true of us humans. I don't know if this is a universal condition of being, but at least for us humans in our experience of reality, it's very difficult for us to know a thing well without having some experience of the opposite, right? So mm -hmm. you don't really understand riches without having been poor. You don't understand health without having been sick. You don't, um, we could just make an infinite list of these things and we could all agree that your knowledge of X in some sense, the depth of it requires a knowledge of its opposite or experience, experiential knowledge of its opposite. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and think about it this way too. If you were going to write the, the story of your life, um, how would you want it to be? Would it, would you want it to be that you were like, born into a royal family and everything you ever wanted was brought to you on a silver platter forever and ever and ever. And that was your story. That would be in some sense, the most uninteresting story you could ever write. 
nobody would pay attention to it. Um, and the people who have that experience often end up being sad, depressed. Um, right. Something's and lose, been lose everything eventually. I mean, people who are born into that lifestyle typically lose everything within a generation. <laughs> so. so what it says to me is that there has to be something good lurking, even in what we would, you know, with a, with a sloppy label put as bad or evil or pain, suffering, all these things that we carelessly would assign to like, Hey, if in a perfect world, a good God would have completely eliminated these things. Mm -hmm. Well, it's try and try and write a good story that has no pain or suffering in it. I challenge you to do that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think it's possible. And so what does that, what does that mean about the fundamental nature of at least what it means to be human, if not the nature of reality itself? Well, and there's two things going on there. One is that if you, I'm sure that anybody, if we do end up publish, publishing this, anybody listening would recognize that if you look back over your own life, the things that have given your own life any sort of meaning, structure, richness, whatever, are those times that were struggles that you had to get through, you know, <clears throat> bad things that happened that you can now look back and see all the things that you learned from it and I'm hearing all kinds of stories about that right now of people who are discovering a lot of things just from being confined to their homes or, mm -hmm. or people who've been through this virus and come out the other side. Then there are also all the people who lose their lives in something like this. In, on that scale, you have to start looking at the historic scale of things and recognize that uh, for each individual human, our time scale is so small that we don't no. see the bigger picture. But in the bigger picture, when you step back and you look through the lens of somebody like Tom Holland, let's say, who really understands these huge historical time frames, you can see how these huge wrongs that have been righted have manifestly catapulted mankind forward and created greater levels of beauty, opportunity, goodness for people everywhere. But, but there were whole generations that had to go through extreme suffering to get to this place where we are today. You know, and we often talk about this in terms of like even technology you're standing on the shoulders of giants because of all the stuff that's been written in the code long before you that you never saw anything, never knew anything about. And a lot of that took a lot of pain and suffering and sweat on somebody's brow and everything else. And nowadays people just plug in and get on their phone and do all this stuff. And they have no idea of all the work and sweat that came before. Yeah. So I mean, our, our, our time scales are just way too small. Well, it's funny too, when you talk about too, the, the response of the fear towards the death being produced by this virus, right? Um, there's, there's an interesting phenomenon there where it, it's almost like people suddenly have forgotten that everybody that dies from this virus was going to die anyway, right? Like that, that is where we're all going to, right? That, that is inevitable. That's the most certain thing that you as an adult individual should know. And yet it's the last thing any of us want to be confronted with. And so it's some, something of this, the response to this virus is this sort of outrage of having to be reminded of that. And, and there's even, and even in how we think about how we're going to get past this and we're going to get to this, we're going to get this vaccine and then we're going to go back to like, then we can go back to life as normal, which is, oblivious to the fact that we're going to die someday is really what we want to return to. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but, but it's just an issue of time scales, right? Because we, we know this all the time and, and most of the ways that we die in the modern world are things that are preventable, you know, things like, uh, you know, related to diet and, um, um, you know, exercise and things of that things that we know, like, 
how diabetes develops and, and, and heart disease and all the things we, we know very well what, what you can do, the steps you can take to prevent them. But because those things play out over longer time scales, it doesn't, it's not that it, we don't, we can ignore them because it, it happens by degrees so slowly we can ignore them. Whereas the virus happens in, you know, days or weeks. And so that makes it much more, it brings it, to our consciousness much more directly for whatever reason we don't um we don't think on those longer longer time scales or at least we don't experience fear in that on those longer time scales when perhaps we should mm -hmm. I, I saw something interesting the other day um i think it was like a stoic philosopher of some sort that i saw he basically said um that we we tend to think about looking forward to our death which is the wrong paradigm. We should instead think about death has already claimed some huge percentage of our lives, right? Like all the time that's passed you now has already been claimed by death. So what you have left is just this, this fraction of time, whatever that's been given to you. And you don't really even know how long that is. And we don't really live in that reality. There's this, I don't know what it is, but it's like this weird bubble that of, of, of our desire for safety, which demands an obliviousness to death. And we're outraged by having death in our face. Yeah, that, that captures it pretty well, I think. Yep. Now I think he's gonna get to that in this paragraph if we just plug forward a little bit farther. Okay, let's do it. So I did find it interesting that he juxtaposes the masculine principles of security, tyranny, and order with the feminine principles of darkness, dissolution, creativity, and chaos. <laughs> I know a lot of feminists get very upset by that. I, again, I think it's important to point out that masculine and feminine are not male and female, right? Within, within the masculine, within a male, there's all these things. And within the female, there's all these things. Now, we may say that a female may embody more feminine stuff and a male will tend to embody more masculine stuff, but that's, they're, they're separate things. Um, and again, what, 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 mm, masculinity and femininity are, are like these, again, these distillations mm -hmm. at, at, at their patterns at the spiritual level that um, where at, at the matter level, there's so much variability that it's, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily useful to try and apply to them, to, um, to an individual, to understand an individual, but well, so he goes on to say, furthermore, as a snake, the Ouroboros has the capacity to shed its skin, to be reborn. Thus, it also represents the possibility of transformation and stands for the knower who can transform chaos into order and order into chaos. So basically, he has just said that the Ouroboros is the known and the unknown and the knower. And in, in all of his earlier writings, it's a he, trinity. He described, well, he describes the whole universe as being composed of the known and the unknown and the knower. So mm -hmm. he's basically saying that the Ouroboros is everything. Isn't he? Yeah. The Ouroboros is a manifestation of everything or represents somehow in this, this image, represents everything. Order, chaos, and the, the spirit that navigates between order and chaos. I don't know how else yeah. to read that sentence. It represents the possibility of transformation and stands for the knower 
who can transform chaos into order and order into chaos. And, and yeah, I mean, I, also, I, I think talk about the knower, isn't he talking about the Christ figure that that goes over into the chaos and captures the treasures that are hidden there and brings them back and to revivify order. Yeah. I mean, this, this gets pretty deep philosophically really quickly. And I don't think I have the philosophical chops to go, go to that depth, but I just, I have my own certain intuitions on the subject. And one of the things that this takes me to is also, again, you got, you, you got to start thinking, well, if this is everything, then again, where is God in all this? Um, and, and furthermore, the big question I have is what does this say about God's ability to transform and what, what, what changes does he undergo in his relationship to these processes? Um, which I think is something worth thinking about and talking about, although it's something that's very triggering for modern Christians, because again, the, their definitions and categories of God are just very static. Um, and um, that, that he's like this thing, he's this box that you can, you can, you know, you can draw lines around and um, you can make a flow chart of and all these things. And, they'll they'll tacitly admit that okay that that drawing doesn't really represent him but they would say that there is a drawing that is more complicated that does exist that statically represents him and it doesn't change ever and i don't i don't think that's a scriptural view and i don't think it's something that experientially makes much sense either of our relationship to god but i don't know how to understand it either um because by definition, God is beyond our ability to get our hands around and grasp. But what is what su is suggested to this in me is that I don't know that God's in this with us. That whatever process it is that creation is going through from beginning to end and its path of redemption, which I think is ongoing, it it was in some sense accomplished in the cross but then as peterson says it's, says in another you know thing there's a sense in which it's not yet done it's being worked out that there's that god's in it with us that there's a process he's going through us as well there's some sort of interchange back and forth that the biblical story ends with a union between us and god and there's some sort of like something being worked out along the way that that doesn't really fit into most modern Christians' eschatology. I don't think I don't think they have they have such nice clean lines for how this all works out, and they argue about you know post trib, mid trib, blah 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 blah. It's like it's very like start categories, and it's you're either in this box or this box or this box, and like I think it's way more weird than that. <laughs> whatever is whatever is transpiring, it's well, way more complicated. Me a lot is just uh, when I look at things like uh, in discussions wrapped around infinity. Um, you can have something that's 100 feet high and something that's a mile high. But beyond both of those, the, the, difference, the difference between the 100 feet and infinity and the mile and infinity there is no difference. Infinity is right, right. infinity, right? Exactly. So infinity is still so far above even the highest thing of which we can conceive. Infinity is still so magnifiedly far above that, that, that it's still infinity. We, we can't, you know, it's, it's above and beyond anything that we could ever hope to conceive. So to try to put a boundary around it is just like so silly so i, I was reading this one um, church father i in the orthodox church i can't remember what his name was i'll find it and put it in the in the notes if we publish this 
and he's talking about how a circle is a line. And that was kind of hard for me to wrap my head around that, but then as he began to explain it, it made perfect sense because an infinite circle, if, if you could begin to imagine a circle that is infinitely large, the, the curvature would be infinitely, yep. right? So but, which it's just like people can imagine that we live on a flat earth because it's such a big circle that yeah. it, it, it appears it to be like, flat. It looks like a line. But, but he actually goes through the reasoning process that a circle is a line. And then he goes through the same reasoning process that a triangle is a line. And so that the, the infinite line is the foundation of everything, which really makes a lot of sense in, in, in one way, because the, the axis, the axis mundi that the ancients used to talk about, you know, the, the tree with the roots that go down and the branches go up, but, but the line or the, um, the staff, the, the budded rod, all of those things, this, this line thing that happens, the line goes all the way down and all the way up because it's infinite. And, um, I see. I think that's where people's problem is where they got, they don't see God in both dimensions. They see him all the way at the top, but they forget that he's also all the way at the bottom too. Because he, because it's like when Jordan Peterson talks about uh, hierarchy, the, the proper hierarchy is when that which is at the top of the hierarchy returns down and informs and nurtures and strengthens and supplies everything that's needed for the bottom of the hierarchy. So it's this constant thing like this, mm -hmm. which kind of, when I, when I visualize it, I kind of get to that thing. I don't know if you ever heard Eric Weinstein's discussion with Joe Rogan when he's talking about this, um, Now I can't remember the name of it, but it's some mathematical construct that's so weird. It's a, is it one of his fiber bundles? It's, it's some kind of a it's some kind of a fiber bundle, yes. But it's it's got a name to it, and um, <clears throat> there's some artist who made an attempt to represent it in graphic form, and it's this kind of thing, you know. It's, it's like an infinite loop. Yes, but it's it's always coming back down and yeah. and gathering up into itself and then going back up again and coming back down. And so, wait, you know, it reminds me of uh, I don't know. There's a there's a book by Douglas Hofstetter. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, Godel Escher Bach. Is the name of the book, um, and he 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 promulgates the idea in the book about that what what consciousness is is this sort of strange loop. He, he he talks about like a Mobius strip and all these different kind of looping patterns, and that that that's in some sense is what what consciousness is is this thing that kind of bends back in on itself, um, and that um, it's a very interesting book and I read it when I was really young. I didn't really get some of the concepts in it, and I think there's a lot of speculation in the book beyond just the underlying mathematics, but it's. Uh, it's interesting to think about because I, I think there is, again, it's this circle again. It's this thing that comes back in on itself, the, the snake that swallows its own tail. Um, you know, I just figured out what it is about the, the, the image of the Ouroboros. The reason it bothers me to think about it as the ground of all being is that it, sounds a little bit too much like some of the eastern religions where everything is cyclical mm -hmm. always cyclical like reincarnation or you know everything's going around in a circle all the time where i tend to have much more of this picture partly because of the way the scripture is written of a beginning and an end that 
that you go from point A to point B. Yeah. Or like Jordan Peterson is always talking about what there is and what should be and how do you get from what there is to what should be. And that's when the anomaly shows up in the middle. So it, there are obstructions to the path of getting from A to B. But, but it's all linear. It's yeah. not a circle. It, there, it's just a different lens, right? For looking at the same thing. Like you, you could look at a life as a going from point A to point B, but you could also look at it in terms of all these loops. And I think sometimes it is more, it is useful to think about the loops because that's, that's where we spend most of our time. This is, this is true in, in programming as well. You'll, you'll, you know, you'll, in every like almost useful thing that any program does, you'll have what's called the main function, which is what everything's going on. And it calls out to all these other little functions and everything, but almost everything, it, it'll spend 89, 90% of its time in this main function and going through it top to bottom and then calling out the different things to pull them in. But, and, and I think it, it, it's a useful way to conceptualize things because it, it helps you zero down on the areas that you can incrementally improve about your life whether it's the habits you have in a day, right? Because that you're going to go through this daily cycle over and over and over again your whole life. So if you think about how do I, how does that, how do I construct this cycle of a day in a way that works well or, or anything like, uh, uh, um, I don't know. There's, there's just all these cycles or the cycle of a year or a month or a week. If you, if you think in those cycles, it can be very useful for, trying to get very small, measurable, incremental improvements to the fundamental structure of who, who you are in those patterns. And I, I think even within the linear structure of, you know, God being alpha and omega, let's say we, we get to the end of revelation. We're all in heaven. We're all united one with another. The, the wedding supper of the lamb has taken place. We are married to Christ Christ is united to us. God is all in all. The reconciliation of all things has happened. But even there, there's something further that's happening. And we don't, I, I, I think it's not like the end, right? It's, it's, it's the end of one chapter, but it's the beginning of something else new that we don't yet know what it is, which is why I always like, you know, people always like referring to uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, last battle quote, further up and further in. Mm-hmm. And, and Paul said this recently, like, it's not like we're going to get to heaven and be like, I know it all. There's going to be some further exploration. He talked about, you know, maybe being able to sit down like with Augustine and having a conversation. And there would be this further exploration because there is this infinite, that, that's, that's one of the things I like about the Ouroboros too, is it's, there is this infinity in it, that it doesn't ever stop. There is there's an end of sorts, but, but that end is a new beginning. Um, and I, I know I, it, it, it's bothersome to the Western mind because it just, your categories fall apart in, in the midst of that infinity. Um, but maybe don't, don't think about the, of course we can't contemplate the ultimate circle, but we can, see the ways these other smaller circles feed up into it and use that as usable representations for improving our lives and figuring out what we will be in contribution to that, uh, that larger circle. Yeah, that's a very helpful picture. Plus it, when you were talking, I said all of a sudden got a picture of, do you remember that time when Jordan Peterson was talking about the Bible being the very first hyperlinked book? Mm -hmm. showed that illustration when you look at that illustration it's very much like that there's all these loops in the bible all these connections that go round and round and round yeah so, you know starting at the beginning and going back to the end and and um 
Yeah. It, what's funny, I just discovered this book today. I, you, if you're familiar with Donald Newth, he's a, he's a really famous... Um, N-E-N-U-T-H. But he's a really famous uh, professor. Okay. He, he was at Stanford, but he's a, a professor of computer science. He's probably written like basically what people consider the Bible of computer science. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's this, this uh, ongoing you know, textbook series that he still hasn't yet completed. <laughs> um, and he, I think he's in his 80s now. But I, I just learned this today. I, maybe I knew this at one point, but he's, he's like a really big Christian and he'd written a book on the Bible where he went through, he just sampled the um, chapter three, verse 16 of every book in the Bible as a way to sample the whole Bible. And which I, I just found was like, oh, I'm, that's really interesting. I don't know if the book's interesting or not, but I just found the idea itself interesting um, as a way to kind of get a different lens into what, what's going on in the book. But it, it's kind of a rabbit trail, but that what you were saying just made me think of it. Yeah, was, that reminds me years ago, somebody told me one time that a good way to divide up your month is to <clears throat> take each day of the month and read the psalm that it would relate to that number. Mm-hmm. So on the first of the month, you read Psalm 1, Psalm 31, Psalm 61, Psalm 91, and Psalm 121. And then the second day of the month, you read Psalm 2, Psalm 32, Psalm 62. Psalm. And it, That's it, pretty cool really really interesting what happens when you do that i mean it almost borders on a little weird but sometimes it almost feels like astrology because it just feels like oh wow i really needed that this morning in particular you know (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's interesting how that works and i think it's related to it's related to the idea of like you've talked about with your art of, of needing to constrain down the possibilities mm-hmm. within to a frame of mode that you can say, this is the section for today. Mm-hmm. And something about that designation changes something. It mostly probably in your consciousness, but maybe it's even a larger something that changes as well. You know, I, I can think when you were saying that I was thinking of, I used to be like that, uh, with this book, my utmost for his highest, mm-hmm. they, there was like it's 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 doled out in pages for every day, mm-hmm. and I, I I had the same phenomenon of like oh man this is exactly speaks to today, mm-hmm. you know, and it's on this day and there's there's like you have that feeling of like oh this is magical, you know this is you can become kind of weirdly superstitious about it right you know and like oh what does this mean for you know, like you can get really weird i also have a c.s lewis daily reader thing that does i can have the same kind of interaction with that as well but it's it's interesting something well, something probably changes it probably it. refines the lens with which you're looking at it right i mean right, the fact it's, that you're looking at it on that day means that you're looking at it through a different lens and if you were looking on it on some other day you would be looking at it through a different lens and that's the interesting thing about scripture or about any kind of deep wisdom is that the lens that you bring to it gives it all these different layers and textures and levels and you can get way down deep in stuff. Right. Because if you're dealing with a, a pattern that's deep enough, it's going to become represented in all sorts of unexpected places. And so anytime you get deep enough with your the pattern again you, you it's almost it's universally applicable in some sense or at least at least sections of it definitely will be well we're almost finished with this paragraph why don't we finish it up here <clears throat> okay. the uroboro stands for or comprises everything that is as of yet unencountered prior to its differentiation as a consequence of active exploration and classification. It is the source of all the information that makes up the determinate world of experience and is simultaneously the birthplace of the experiencing subject. So what do you make of that? 
So it reminds me of this book that I'm going through, mm -hmm. obviously, because that's my lens right now. But um, one of the big things that, that C.S. Lewis and Barfield were one of the most basic contentions of what they were arguing about was the nature of truth. And, and C.S. Lewis had, you know, this kind of steel trap mind that was very logical. And he saw his conception of truth was always within the propositional things that you could say definitionally were true or false. That truth for him didn't make sense outside of that framework. Whereas Barfield was, was pushing and arguing towards him seeing truth more like this process of knowing itself that that was more what truth is. And that's kind of what I, what I'm hearing here, right? It's the source of all the information, but it, it's also the birthplace of the experiencing subject. It's both at the same time. It is, it's all the information, but it's also that coming back upon itself of knowing and experiencing the information too, which is, is some is separate, but also part of that process. Um, well, in, in if you look at that in the bigger picture of the, <clears throat> the primordial ideas about the creation of the world, the birthplace of the world was this coming out of this place of chaos. <clears throat> and then chaos is simultaneously the source of all information because as long as we're standing in order, the order is the place of all the known information, but that's only what's known. <clears throat> And all the new information is in the chaos. So when right. the bottom falls out and you're plunged into chaos, that's where all the new information lies. Because where you were was rigid, stultified, no new life at all. But you've fallen into this pit and now there's possibility. So even on that scale, that's what Jordan Peterson's always talking about, that the chaos is the source of all the information that makes up the determinate world of experience and simultaneously the birthplace of the whole universe. So, so we come out of the chaos into order and then we fall into the chaos periodically. And, and see, this is also where I think about creation itself and what this is something I, I've talked about in some of my past conversations with Paul, but it makes me, I've always had, I kind of have this question of what, what is, what sort of cost does God pay in the act of creation? And I, I think, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever this, this endless potential is, it's not nothing, right? It's, we, we tend to conceptualize it as this, you know, people here was, was formless and void, but there's, there's something, it's almost like, I don't know. I, the way, part of how I conceptualize it is it's almost like God lays out this, this canvas that, that now the world and all of the beings that inhabit it and the matter and the structure can now write on and can now subsist on and have, can come into being on top of. Um, and I feel like my conception of God is that he provides that in some sense out of him, his own being, that something of him is almost like laid down. And so even though he is infinite and in timeless and all the things, it's like he allows himself to be constrained and to become in, to come into relationship with something that is finite. Um, and there's, I don't think we perhaps think about the costs associated with that. Um, and, and I've always thought, you know, that, that the cross in some sense is, you know, Jesus says that he came to show the father. I don't think, I think the cross is, is this, you know, cosmic event of, of ultimate worth and significance, but it's also pointing to something that God, I think is doing all the time. Mm-hmm. Have you, have you ever seen that, um, I guess it's a story, a myth maybe, 
some sort of a bird, a mother bird that tears open her own chest and eats, eats her own heart to feed her baby with. Have you ever seen that? No. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to find that and send it to you because it's, um, that's the, when you started to say that about what kind of a cost did he have to pay? That's the immediate image that sprang to my mind was this mother bird that out of her own heart feeds her, her baby. Well, it's funny too, because like when this, when the spirit is described hovering over the waters, it is like a, a bird like imagery for that hovering. Um, and then and of course in, in the, I think it's the gospel of John where, you know, Jesus talks about, you know, and when he's going to Jerusalem, you know, how I wished, Oh, Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, how I wished I could gather you like a mother hen gathers her chicks. There's this sort of, yeah, there is, there is something of that. I don't know. And, and, and even, even in Jesus's, declaration that we relate to God as father. I don't, I don't know that we take that seriously either. Um, in terms of uh, father is, is the thing from which you are generated from. And I feel like uh, our conceptions of that are much, are much more logical. You know, it's, it's like, you know, God sits off at a distance and, and says, let there be, let there be. And there is, there is that element to the creative act but there is something different specifically once it moves to the creation of humanity. And there's a lot of people that speculate that really when God goes to create humans, something changes in that it's, it's not really done yet, even now. And that's something of what John refers to when he says, when Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. It's some sort of completion of that process. And like when Pilate, you know, shows Jesus to the world in the gospel of John. He says, behold the man, that this is some sort of process God's been in the act of, of doing and to create a human. And, and even in, in the early church fathers, there's a sense in which they, they see themselves becoming human in the act of going to their martyrdom. There's something of, um, Father John Bear has a great line on this. Like, I think it was St. Basil of Ephesus or something like that. And he's, he's, he's talking about, he's like, birth pangs are upon me. You know, like I'm, I'm about to be born into becoming human as he's on his way to Rome to be martyred. And he's like writing to the leaders in Rome to say, don't, don't prevent this from happening. This is God's will. Um, it's, 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 it's very, very moving to mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. yeah whenever i think about things like that i yeah it's very moving um and, and this is what john bear also makes he says is, is the point in jesus is that jesus simultaneously shows us what it means to be god and what it means to be human in the single act on the cross and his death. And what it means to be a father. I mean, I, I get very impatient, I guess, with all the talk about the patriarchy, the tyrannical patriarchy and all of that, because when you, when you study the scriptures and you understand what the scripture is calling a man to be, Calling, is calling a man to sacrifice everything that he is and has for those that are under his care. And so God is saying, I need you to be a father in the same way that I am a father. And that is to give everything that you are for those that are under your care. And that gets illustrated in so many ways in the life of a man and of a husband and of a father if he's truly trying to live out the calling that God has given him. I mean, right. I think right down to the sexual union um, yeah. because a man is, is truly giving everything of himself to, to bring life and beauty into the world, to bring life and beauty to his wife. 
um, understood correctly, I think it is a beautiful, powerful image that we can we can learn from and grow from. And I remember when I was a new believer, I was already 32 when I became a believer. And it took me a while to kind of get a grip on what it really meant when it said father in the scriptures, because in my own family, my father was very distant and not, no warm fuzzies there, no, uh, no counsel, no guidance, nothing like that. And, um, but I was going to uh, an evangelical free church and in that church, the, some of the men, I suppose they were elders or something would be the ones that would hand out the, the um, offering plate down the aisles and everything. And I can still remember the look on those men's faces and there was such a genuine humility and caring and love and, uh, and at the same time, a sort of gentle power and um, masculinity and safety. All of those things were associated with those men. And for me to be able to get that picture of what masculinity was, was extremely healing. And, um, I think that we've kind of lost that picture as we've in so many, in a lot of churches, well, there's two different things going on. One thing is that some of the churches have decided, oh, well, it's not fair that the men do all these things and we should have give women more power and authority in the church. And so they've kind of opened up that wing. And then, and then what that's done is, created a fertile ground for all these arguments about the place of women in the church and the place mm -hmm. of men. And none of those arguments get at any of the underlying symbolic truth and beauty and depth that's in the scripture. And so it's just created all this dissension around something that really was a beautiful illustration to us of what God is trying to show us about himself and about the world that he's created that's my rant for the day. <laughs> yeah. While you were saying that, when, when you said the word humility, that's, it, it struck me. That's, that's another thing that gets lost is I think that this humility of God mm -hmm. and, and in one of my conversations with Paul, where I was talking about this, he made the point that like humility is is God's ability to do all these good things for the just and the unjust alike and not to have to point to himself in doing it. So in terms of like I, what I was saying earlier, this cost that I believe that God pays both in creation and redemption that, that is an ongoing activity of his even now, that he does not point to that, that he doesn't call it out. That he doesn't say, hey, look what I did for you. That there's a, there is this gift that is what we know of as consciousness and existence and being that is just given to us. And he stands back from it. And he, he doesn't, we don't know what cost is associated with it. We don't, we don't have any idea. And yet um, it's just, it's just freely given. Um, and I don't know. It's interesting because, you know, I think people, people are easy. They can easily embrace that idea, but they also, when they, when they think of the humility of God, I think they also think of a God that does not have desire, which I don't think the scripture shows either again. Um, and, and people tend to think, well, a God with the desire would be untrustworthy because we couldn't, we couldn't trust him to not hold back from what he wanted. And, and I, I don't know. I think you can't read the Old Testament prophets or like Hosea and not see that God has desire. And so there's, there's humility and desire and, and both of those together um, that, um, that we don't, we're not in touch with 
for so, sure. And so when you say desire, what, what, what is encompassed in that for you? Do you mean wanting a certain outcome or do you mean, um, are you thinking more about his passion and concern for his creation or? Yeah. I mean, like it, it's, uh, I, I see it as, well, obviously wanting a good outcome just by his very nature, but also a, an experiential sense of, of goodness and evil like that he experiences the reality of those things in a, in a real way. I don't, I just don't subscribe to this kind of deistic picture where God is so far off in heaven, just surrounded by angels being worshiped. And then every now and then peeks in on us. I, I just don't, I don't think that it doesn't make any sense that it's, it's, it's a weird kind of, Again, yeah, it's, it's putting God all the Bible is teaching. I mean, the Bible teaches that he's, he's as close to us as breathing all the time. I mean, so I mean, Right. But I, I, I think the Bible is pretty clear, but, but I think we tend to, again, we want to have him at the top, but not at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, so we, we can't have both. Like again, it, was it McGilchrist or something that talks about we've lost the ability to see a thing in its opposite being true at the same time. Like we, we've lost this kind of expansive capability in our, in our formal logic systems that we've embraced as the, the embodiment of what reason is. Um, and it's, it's, it's so it's beyond one sided. It's just so uh, constricting and narrow and, desiccated and dry and disconnected and it's like all these things that like with that that approach um and it, it's just i think it's infected every every aspect of um uh, of, of of life in, in these modern times but um and and so like whenever i i try and give language to some of the stuff i think people people have this kind of allergic reaction of no god is no, God doesn't have these desires. He doesn't do this. He's, he's beyond all desire. And it's like, and I agree with that to some extent. I, 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 I would say that our ability to comprehend the desire is, is limited, but it, whatever it is, it's not something less than the experience we have. It's something more for sure. For sure. I mean, there's, there's mm -hmm. no doubt. Mm -hmm. And I, not, not like an absence of it. So, and well, again, maybe I could connect it up with um, a little bit earlier. You said that when you think of humility, you think God is able to reign on the just and the unjust alike and to give all these gifts with no need to point to himself. And being a selfish human being, the immediate picture that came to my mind was, yes, that's a lot like being a mother or a father because you do all these things for your children and the last thing you want to do is point to yourself and say look at everything i'm doing for you because maybe you heard that when you were a kid and it was not helpful so yeah. <laughs> above all you must not say that to your child right and you must not carry it out in your body language even because kids are not stupid they can see it they can feel it yeah so everything in you has to fight against this need to point to yourself but part of the reason you want to point to yourself is just so that they grow up enough to see to to develop some sense of gratitude and to develop some mm -hmm. sense of um seeing what other people do so that they too can learn to do for others, you know, pay it forward, so to speak. And but, this is where I think death specifically is the ultimate gift because it's the ultimate recognition of that. We, we didn't make ourselves and we, we can't sustain whatever this thing is that we've been given. Like it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a limitation on the deception it can only go so far, right? It has a final terminus of uh, 
you know, for all of us that we all know about ahead of time. Well, so in that sense, that's a beautiful picture of what it means to die to self and to live to Christ because In a, in a perfect environment in which I could truly yield myself to him by, by reckoning myself dead to sin, like it says in Romans 6, then I would receive that ultimate gift of death, of limiting, limit, how did you put that? Limiting the... the, the how far the deception can go Limit, the, limiting, of, our, of our own independence, autonomy. Yes, limiting uh, my self-deception. Yeah, so because true freedom comes from limitation. We know that. And so limiting my self-deception, maybe that's what it means to reckon myself dead to sin, is to come to that place of really allowing myself to die to self, so that I can live to Christ, so that I can receive that gift of death and still have some life left to give afterwards so that I am still operating as an ambassador for Christ in the world rather than just rolling myself up and say, okay, good, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, from, from Jordan Peterson talks about this too, that it's, it's always better for you to, to choose to face the thing rather than to have the thing imposed on you. Right. Um, although like, as you mentioned earlier, like all the, like all of us can point to times in our lives where something unexpected and tragic or something that produced some level of suffering that we would have not chosen for ourselves turned into something good. Right. And that, you know, but there's always, the flip side of that, which is in, in the choosing of how you respond to those events, you can also go resentful as well. We all know people that have had those events happen and chose that path, right? It wasn't a good thing for them. It actually made them more resentful. So it's Jordan Peterson points out that we're always better off if we voluntarily kind of confront these hard truths, these realities and look them in the face. And there's something that comes alive in us that's different than when it's kind of forced on us. And it's, you know, I, I've noticed in my instances in my life where this has happened, it's only, it's very clear to me that there was a grace that enabled me to not become resentful and to see see the positive. And, and without that, the, who knows what would have happened. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good place to wind up because that that gift of grace is um what makes any of these things possible maybe that gift of grace is that mother bird eating her own heart to feed her babies yeah who knows what grace costs him right yeah. well and i was taught years ago the acronym that grace is god's riches at christ's expense but since Christ is God, right? It's the Ouroboros. Mm -hmm. This has been a great conversation, Michael. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Why don't you think about it and see if you think we can publish it? Okay. I think it's okay, but I'll, I'll wait to hear from you. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thanks. Have a great day. Right. Bye -bye. You too.